it will be Nicholas. Nicholas, you can present yourself. Hey everyone, uh, it's nice to meet you all. My name is Nicholas and uh, I'm a fourth year medical student uh, that's currently undertaking a one year BSc in Cancer Frontiers at Imperial. And I'm sort of the, the new team member uh, who's been with the team for a little over a month now. Okay. Perfect. So obviously uh, this project wouldn't be possible uh, without all these people here. Um, we have our academic sort of supervisors, Professor Dan Elson and Mr. Daniel Leff. Uh, and of course, Maria and Martha. And of course, the massive surgical team who work so hard to make all this possible. And uh, last but not least, our patients who we owe so much to, and we thank you for making this possible. Uh, so what is fluorescence guided surgery? So just to give a brief overview, uh, it's a type of surgery which uses contrast or dyes and a special camera system to uh, particularly highlight targeted tissue or tissue of interest. And in our case, this would be breast cancer. It enables us to better visualize it during surgery. And this helps us to make surgery easier, safer, and let, lets us achieve better results, both from a cosmetic standpoint, but also from a health standpoint. Uh, so just to go under, uh, just to review some of the underlying principles um, behind our uh, project, um, the nature of light. So light can be split into um, different types of light and different types of energy, starting with radio waves, which we can see on the right of the screen, very commonly used in communications and media, uh, microwaves, which of course refer to our uh, bog standard microwaves image below, um, infrared radiation, visible spectrum or visible light uh, that we usually call it, which is the specific type of energy that we actually use and take advantage of in our uh, project and in our imaging. Ultraviolet light, obviously derived from the sun uh, and then X-rays and gamma rays. And as I've gone progressively to the left of the screen, uh, you'll notice that the energy levels increases. And within the medical field, we there are different sort of technologies and imaging technologies, especially that take advantage of these different types of energies, which we can see here. Uh, with radioactive tracers, this tends to take advantage of higher energies, such as gamma energy. Um, and as we can see here, this is an image of the brain uh, using an, a, a tracer called FDG which we can see is being um, uptaken by areas of the brain and it helps us to better visualize it. On the right, we have X-rays. So these are uh, very commonly used typically to image bone. Uh, these use a form of energy, which is um, let's say less powerful than the radioactive tracers. However, quite strong nonetheless. Then we have ultrasound. Again, another very common uh, imaging technology can be used for a wide, wide variety of uh, medical uh, uses. Um, here we can see imaging of a major blood vessel called the carotid artery. And finally, uh, we have optical imaging, which again is, let's say, the, the type of energy that we, um, or light that we use in our um, imaging in our project. Uh, and out of these four, it carries the least amount of energy. And so is, let's say, um, less dangerous, I guess, for patients. It's, it's more safer, has a higher, safer profile. Um, so yeah, this is just be a summary slide. So as you can see here, gamma rays are typically um, used in radioactive imaging. So um, positron emission tomography, uh, PET tracers. And we have X-rays over here, uh, still a lower energy, but nonetheless high energy. Uh, and then finally, you have the visible spectrum here uh, and visible light, which again is uh, of importance in our project and is what we typically use uh, which is of low energy and therefore safer for patients. Great, thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, I'll take over from here. Um, so uh, as Nicholas said, we're trying to uh, use this part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is um, harmless for the patients. Uh, we use um, two camera system uh, for, for the first and the second clinical trial uh, regarding this project. Uh, mainly, we use a lens system that you can see here uh, to bring the light into focus. And then we split the light into two different um, branches. The one branch leads to a color camera, which captures normal conventional color images of the surgical field. So, um, 
of uh, the area that we're interested, uh, interested in imaging. And then uh, the other branch uh, leads us to the fluorescence camera with a filter in front of it so that uh, it can only grab the uh, light, the fluorescent light, which is coming uh, from the contrast agents uh, that we use uh, to visualize the tumor. So that's the overall um, uh, basics of how the system works. Now we want, uh, we want to take this system uh, to the surgery and uh, first of all, test the feasibility uh, of using it uh, in the operational theater. For example, does it uh, integrate seamlessly with the overall over procedure? Because if we add a lot of delays, um, this is obviously a problem. Um, so, I think this is... Yeah, this is for me. Um, so, at the moment, the type of surgery that we're proposing using that fluorescent light is already in use in a couple of areas. And so, at the moment, you can use it for mapping um, blood vessels. So this is really important when we're doing plastic surgery and, you know, making flaps go from one part of the body somewhere else. And we need to make sure that they are going to stay alive and not fall apart once they've been moved. Um, this is also important in, you know, bowel cancer operations where we take out a bit of bowel cancer and we join it back together just to make sure that that joint stays nice and happy and healthy and doesn't fall apart later on. Um, we can also use this for mapping lymph vessels. So lymph vessels are the ones where your body um, has white cells to fight infection, but it's also sometimes the place where cancer likes to jump to. So for those of you who are the patients um, from our trial, um, you would have had that kind of mapping done with the radioactive, radioactive tracer and the blue dye. So we could actually use this dye instead of those ones. Um, and we published a meta-analysis saying that actually our using that is better than using those ones or, or just as good. Um, but yeah, so there's lots of uses that you can have for it, but for cancer, it's not quite there yet because the drugs that are available aren't specific enough. And so the clinical need in terms of breast cancer is that one in five women who have just the lump removed won't have all of it taken out. And that's a really shit thing because then you have to have another surgery and you delay your chemo and radiotherapy and you have all that stress of not having it once but twice. And it's just really awful. And it's because us surgeons can't see it, can't feel it, might miss it, and no matter how hard we try. And so the approaches that we have at the moment is that, um, well, you wait the two weeks for us to look under a microscope and tell you if we made a mess or not. Uh, you can take an x-ray of the specimen, but that's not perfect. And we'll show you a picture of that later because it's not idiot proof enough, shall we say. Um, you can do an ultrasound in the operation, but not every surgeon is capable of wielding an ultrasound while you do it. And for most of you um, and most women, you'll have a seed or a wire to help us find it, but it helps us find the center and like the heart of the tumor rather than tell us how big it is, how much it spreads. And so, yes, we'll get the seed or the wire out, but you might not get those little like tentacles as it were that spread out. So our solution is to use that kind of fluorescent mapping of the tumor. <laughs> Great. Uh, so having that as our motivation, uh, we started the first clinical trial uh, back in 2018, uh, where we recruited overall 10 patients. And uh, the aim of that trial was to first of all test the feasibility, as I said, of technique. Uh, the protocol uh, has as following. Uh, we've been injecting tw injecting 12.5 milligrams of indocyanine green, which is a clinically approved, a, approved agent. And thus we, we have chosen it for the specific application. Uh, we have administered this intraoperatively, and then we, we would take images of the tumor in situ. And after the, the removal of the tumor, uh, we would take an image of the specimen ex vivo um, and also the surgical cavity. Uh, then, of course, we would um, um, try to process the images to uh, decide on whether they are accurate enough in detecting the tumor. And, um, and at the same time, the specimens would be in the histopathology lab to be formally uh, tested uh, in order to, to realize um, where is the ground truth. Um, so this is uh, our design, improvement, and performance testing protocol. 
Uh, first of all, we would take the device to the, um, to the hospital to have it uh, checked uh, in terms of electrical safety. And then we would um, test it during the surgery and we would try to um, improve the design and of the software and of the hardware in order to make it more um, um, clinically relevant. Um, and then after that, uh, we would take uh, the images uh, and, in, and in situ, as I said, and ex vivo. We would pre-assess the images uh, while comparing them with other imaging modalities. And then um, we would um, uh, essentially use the histopathology report, so the ground truth. So what do we know about where the tumor is or not in order to mark uh, this in our images and then compare it with our own results and understand whether this technique is accurate enough in detecting where the tumor is. For example, here you can see we have a very good result since the, um, the green part, which is the result from our own processing and the, um, the ground truth, which is the um, um, contouring of the tumor, they are uh, overlapping. Uh, so we've published these results from the first clinical trial quite recently. Uh, in the Journal of Physics D, um, where um, we introduced the system, uh, how it works, and we have proven the feasibility of the technique. We have demonstrated that the system is sensitive um, uh, to the fluorescence in vivo signals and with a submillimeter resolution, as you can see here. And also we've used some uh, novel classification techniques. Uh, this here, you can see the result of the classification uh, in order to uh, identify where the tumor is uh, in the specimens. Then we moved on to the second clinical trial since we've already proven the feasibility, uh, which will be introduced by Martha. So yeah, so having proven that the camera works, it doesn't bug the surgeons too much because it comes in, comes out, and the surgery goes pretty smoothly regardless, um, we then said, you know what, let's see how well it works. And so we took another 40 patients with ICG, um, and then we're going to have another 40 patients with another drug that is soon to be coming, because we just had the contract signed yesterday, um, and we will, with the ICG patients, test two different timings. So one of them, we would test the blood vessel timing, so see whether or not the blood vessels supplying the cancer give us an interesting signal that's different from normal breast tissue. And the other one we would test is a leaky timing, as in we give the drug early, we let it leak into the tumor just because blood vessels in the tumor aren't quite normal and so they don't keep everything inside like they're meant to, um, and then let it flush out of the system and then only take pictures of the leaky bit that's left behind. Um, so yeah, so we split that into two groups of 20. So the results, on the left, you can see a picture. And now that's an x-ray picture that we do during the surgery. So that's something very routine that we did for everyone. Um, and you take a picture of the specimen. I don't know how obvious it is, but there is a circle in the middle of it, and that is the nipple. And the circle just to the bottom right of it is the tumor. So it was just behind the nipple, meaning we couldn't offer this poor lady a nipple sparing procedure but you can see on the image to the middle of the screen that again, you can see the nipple and you can see that same tumor glowing brightly kind of to the bottom right of it, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, so this tumor was a millimeter below the skin, meaning we could see through the skin and get a signal from something deeper. Uh, next slide, please. And um, so, yeah, so we took all of these uh, tumors and then we'd also take pictures of them while they were getting prepared for those like microscope tests, if that makes sense. And so what they do is they take that lump that they've removed and after having soaked it in formalin, um, they cut it up and slice it like, like bread. Um, and so on the top, you can see what our eyes could see as in like a color picture um, of that bread loaf slicing of the lump. And where the red circles are, are where we could see the tumor. So it's not super, super obvious here, but when we were feeling it, it's a little bit whiter than the normal surrounding yellowish tissue. The bottom layer of those pictures is the infrared camera signal. So I appreciate that the picture in the very middle is kind of too overexposed, but the one 
the one with the red circle on it that's in the middle, that one you can see a whitish outline, which is the blood vessels that are leading into the tumor and supplying the tumor. Um, and so you can see that actually on the middle one, I think the best. Um, so yeah, so that was one of the cases. And then the other cohort was with the leaky timing. So that's on this slide. So that was that we gave the drug at the very beginning of the surgery once the patient was asleep. We let it leak in, flush out, and then just have whatever was left behind inside of that tumor show us a signal. So that first set of pictures, there is no tumor, there is not really any glowing. The second set and the third set, you can actually see that on the color one, again, not obvious, <laughs> but you could feel that there is a firmer, slightly more pinkish than yellow mass. And on the infrared is where you can really see that there is something going on. That whitish glow within the red circle is what is giving me the signal that that is tumor. So what does this mean for you? So essentially what we're trying to do is prevent women from having to undergo a second surgery. Um, unfortunately, within our groups, we had at least, I would say, tw we, held, we held to the national statistic of about one in five. Um, which is not ideal, but it's because we at this point in time cannot say for sure that this system works. It's still too early. We're still doing all the image analysis. And so we couldn't prevent that, which is heartbreaking because this means you have that second surgery. This means that we tried to save your breast by doing a small lump removal, but actually if I have to go back in a second time, well, then I don't know how nice your breast is going to look after. Your scar might be worse. The pain might be worse. You have all of the risks of the complication of a surgery again with the, you know, the bleeding, the um, fluid collections. You don't get your other cancer treatments right away because with radiotherapy, you have to wait for everything to heal for about two months. Um, again, with chemotherapy as well, I need to make sure you don't have a scar there because then that's a source of infection. And if you have chemotherapy, you're very having a very weakened immune system. Um, you've got sick leave, you've got all the extra stress. And then at the end of the day, actually it costs the hospital quite a lot to have to set up another surgery for the patients. So overall, it's a really crap problem that it would be great if we could fix and we're working on it. Good. Uh, so yeah, um, we've, I've been mentioning that the, the technique is feasible to be uh, used intraoperatively. And yes, the results are very promising, but there is still um, a lot of work that uh, we need to do. Uh, one of the limitations uh, I would like to mention, especially for optics, uh, so the light that we use, yes, it is patient safe. Um, yes, uh, we, can, uh, we can definitely use it because the risk to, ben to, the, the risk to benefit um, analysis says so. But the, the thing is that uh, the light is being um, absorbed and so we cannot really see very deep into tissue. So the signals we are getting will be uh, as deep as three millimeters from the surface. Uh, this is one limitation. Um, but still, if, um, if you regard that this is um, a real-time imaging technique, uh, you can always guide the surgeon through the three millimeters and as they cut, they can uh, proceed to the next layer and next layer of three millimeters. Uh, and also, uh, these are uh, small scale statistics. We, we didn't include, we didn't recruit many patients. And therefore, in order to uh, say with some level of certainty uh, that the technique is accurate enough, we would need to recruit more patients um, uh, in order to understand and realize um, the accuracy in detecting the tumor of the technique. These are our further resources, some links here. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I think we would take questions. Take questions. All right, thank you very much, Nicholas, Marta, and Maria. That was a great presentation. Um, can I ask, could you explain what in vivo and ex vivo means? Yes, definitely. I think I, I could explain. Uh, so basically, I think I have um, a nice methodology on it. Uh, 
Uh, in vivo means when we are doing the imaging of the tumor, uh, while it is it has not been removed yet, so it's still in the in in the patient. It's not removed, so it's in the living uh, patient. So we we call this imaging in vivo, where the tumor is in the patient. Whereas when the tumor has been removed, just like the second image here, and we image the tumor after it's been removed from the living um, uh, the living the living patient, it's called imaging ex vivo. Thank you. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Marta and Maria? Feel free to type it in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourselves and ask, please do. Uh, yeah, yes. I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Um, uh, can I go ahead? Yes, of yeah. course. Anyone else who has a question, yeah. raise your hand and I'll come to you next. Right, okay. I'll, you I'll, I'll turn my video on, so raise my hand. Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead, Karen. A few questions. Um, the, the light that you see is coming from the fluorescence produced by this um, dye that you yes. put in. Now, does it have to be illuminated or the dye itself produces the light without having to be illuminated by some external light source? Thank you, that's a very good question. I I'm so happy that you're asking this because it's physics. Um, so basically uh, to, to do fluorescence imaging, you need to send some light uh, to the dye. So yes, yes. this is a bit more technical, but uh, I will try to explain this. Uh, here, the lines uh, show the energy uh, that a molecule can have. So uh, for the molecule to transmit fluorescence, so the green part here, uh, means that we need to take it to a higher uh, energetic level. And in order to take it to a higher energetic level, we need to give it some energy. So essentially the fluorescence we get, the light we get from the agent, from the dye, is a part of the energy. We have sent it to, to the dye before it fluoresces. So yes, we need to, to send some light. Yeah, and the follow-on question is about this light source. Um, what wavelength is it? It's near infrared. I will, um, I will use this part uh, of the presentation. So this is the yeah. visible spectrum you see here. Uh, we work a little bit further, uh, further than the red wavelengths. So uh, around 800 nanometers. 800 nanometers yeah. near infrared um, uh, light is harmless. And uh, our eyes are not sensitive to this part of the spectrum, thus it's not visible exactly. It's, it's a it is a little bit further away from red. 800 roughly we use to, to excite the, the dye. And the light from the, from the contrast agent that we detect is around 820 nanometers. So we are here. Right, yeah, yeah. And the, the, the crucial question is the, the dye only is present where there are cancer cells and is not present elsewhere. Now, how well is that understood? And how is that a really good assumption or are there some regions where although the tissue is cancerous, the dye has not got there? So I think I'll take that question. Um, and it's a very good think, question. <laughs> it is a very good question. Um, the, the dye that we're using this time around is not specific. And so that means that it stays in the blood vessels or it might leak into the cancer. And it doesn't always give us the signal that we need. We've been getting some fake signals, if you will, um, where things like scar tissue or fibrosis, especially when women have had like the biopsy first and we've given them a bit of damage, that also gives us a signal and lights up. And so, the trouble with this area is that at this point in time, the drugs that we have are not really specific. The drug that we're going to move into using next, which is called ALA, is a bit more specific because it's taken up more by cancer cells than the other cells. And then it gets stuck at the, like during the metabolism, it gets stuck at the point that glows. And so that it gets stuck 
by because of like six different enzymes that just don't work in cancer cells. So then it's more specific and it gives us more of a signal. But there's lots of drugs at the moment that are being produced that are going through clinical trials right now that try and tackle specific proteins found on cancer. Uh, so that can be a very specific enzyme. So something that, you know, um, let's say in breast cancer in particular, you've got enzymes that try and digest the tissue around it so that it can grow and expand. And so those kinds of enzymes we can try and get a probe into that will activate um, and light up. Equally, you've got certain receptors. So these are like little flags on the cancer cells that are saying, you know, let me grow, let me reproduce a bit more. And so those are present on cancer cells more than normal cells as well. So those are more specific and can give us a better signal, if that makes sense. But because it's still very early days, those are trials that are like happening in California in the odd hospital. So it's very much, it's coming. I suspect it'll probably be another five to 10 years before we can get like a really good agent, but it's very much well underway. Okay. Oh, Let other people ask questions. Michael. Don't look at all right. <laughs> Michael, did you have a question? I, I did. It's a, it's a very quick one, and and just uh, going on to the um, the optics, <clears throat> which I'm quite interested in, and the um, uh, the lenses that you're using. Is this um, are they off the shelf? Are they are they? Do you specify what you need? Um, prior to, to starting the project or, or can you choose from a range or is, um, is it, are other people using them at the same time? Um, yes, these are of the, of the, 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 the thing is um, you aim to accommodate um, a large uh, working distance. Working distance is the distance uh, from the camera to the yeah. base, so to where okay. you yeah. to image. And so we, we really aimed to, to use something that um, ranges in the focal length and you can um, adjust it very easily. So this, this system, um, I've been, we, we, we are on our way on publishing uh, the specifics, um, these specifics, I mean, in terms of the ranges it can accommodate. And yep. uh, from six centimeters to uh, 50 centimeters, uh, mm -hmm. but a clinically relevant uh, working distance is around 30 centimeters close to the patient. We cannot go closer than 10 centimeters anyway. It's, um, it's forbidden for um, safe uh -huh. reasons. So uh, the, um, the specifications we, we are after are mainly to accommodate um, a large working distance and of course with the best resolution possible. The field of view, so uh, how, um, what is the scale of the image we're trying uh, uh, to, uh, to have depends um, on the surgery. So in our case, a diagonal field of view of 10 centimeters is enough for the, um, for the surgeon to see uh, the scene. Thank you. Do just just quickly. Do you have to? Uh, I mean, practice quite a bit before you <laughs> before you go into the actual theater, or is it? Um, you know, it doesn't come with a, an instruction book. I guess you have to get used to handling uh, the the focus, etc. Yeah, definitely a lot of practicing. Uh, firstly, in the lab, uh, you're trying to see the ranges you cover, as I said, the resolution and everything. And then, uh, and that's only for the for the system without the um, tripod we use. Then, mm. if you want to put the system on the tripod, you need to do extra um, extra training to make sure that it is stable, that you can work with the tripod and change the working distances higher, lower, and everything. Yes. Okay. Thank. No. Uh, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank you. But I think, Michael, you've raised a good point. Um, at this point in time, this isn't something that's idiot proof, shall we say. Um, mm. And in order for it to be massively accepted um, in hospital practice, you would need something that, you know, like th through our iterations, we've developed a button that I push that will automatically take the picture. And we're going to, at some point, plan on having an autofocus feature. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to accommodate for to make it as user-friendly as possible. And it's 
I guess, part and parcel of the technological development side of things. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. <laughs> Not to mention the COVID challenges. At one, one point, when you entered theatres, you couldn't leave again. So mm. we had to have uh, a relay team to bring them their 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 kit and their information, uh, then their their equipment to the, to the door. So it took quite a large team just to sort of get things up and running. But they persisted, and we continue to do this even even during COVID with a lot of the restrictions. So well done. There's a question here in the chat. At what stage or stages, pre or post operation, do you think this method is best for? So this method is actually intraoperative. Um, the drug, you can, depending on the drug and on the mechanism of the drug, uh, we like to give it when the patients are asleep. Um, that way, even if there is, you know, a slight discomfort of the fact that I'm giving an extra drug or anything like that, I don't have to give it any extra needles because they've already got ones in from the anesthetist. So it's a very safe time when you have the whole team around. But the pictures themselves, you want to be taking them during the operation so that the surgeon can see on a monitor, this is glowing, that's not glowing. I've cut out all of the glowy bit, that's the tumor, the cavity that's left behind isn't giving me any signal. So I'm confident that everything that is bad has come out. Equally, if there is a little bit of signal left in the cavity that we've left, then we can think, oh, you know what, maybe I should take a little bit more. Um, and that's the kind of feedback that we need while we operate. So it's during the operation that this technique would be used. Thank you. It's meant to be real time, and it is real time. The the operation of the of the system, everything is in real time to facilitate decision making on the spot. Could I ask a question? Please do, Harry. <laughs> Thank you. I I was just wondering how this um, mode of surgery would compare or even combine with the eye knife and mass spectrometry? Wonderful question. Um, so actually, I was having a chat with Mr. Lev, who is the, the surgical lead on, funnily enough, both projects. Uh, and <laughs> we were discussing how ideally, as surgeons in the future, I think it would be synergistic, as in we would probably end up using both modalities because this at the end of the day is a macroscopic tool as in it gives me a picture like my eyes can see of what is going on and what's not going on. Whereas the issue of margins and positive margins, meaning the little points of cancer that are sticking out of the lump, if there are any, that is something that I don't see unless I'm under a microscope. And that's obviously a massive problem because I don't have that kind of feedback. And the eye knife gives me that kind of feedback. So for those of you who don't know what the eye knife is, it's essentially when surgeons cut, we have this amazing fancy tool um, that cuts and cauterizes, as in it burns, all at the same time so that we don't get a lot of blood in there. Um, that tool makes, obviously when you burn things, you make smoke. And so the eye knife system takes that smoke and essentially sniffs out the cancer, if that makes any sense, but it only sniffs it out on where it's touching. So where I'm cutting and making that smoke, it can give me, this is gonna sound like some sort of <laughs> American novel of uh, before Columbus time of like Indian smoke signals. It gives me a smoke signal of this is cancer, this is not. And that will only tell me where it's cutting, whereas this will tell me overall the big signal of this is where the lump is. And then with that knife, I can then say, actually, there's a spot that's been left behind that I couldn't see with my eye or the camera system, but I can feel it with the knife so I can get a little bit more. So ideally, we'll want to combine the two at one point. Sure. 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 Could I ask another question? Um, it's about the, the margin between cancerous tissue and non-cancerous tissue. Now, how, how thick is that and is it well-defined or do you get little tentacles stretching through? And how confident are you after you've gone through this procedure that you have actually removed all the cancerous tissue? That is a wonderful question and that is actually at the crux of it all. Um, you're right, they can be like tentacles. 
And so we can't see them, we can't feel them, we're not that confident. We can, the best we have, the gold standard that we have is that x-ray picture, which that x-ray is, you know, the size of the specimen. It's not going to show me a tiny millimeter tentacle. Um, and, oh goodness, I think I've lost the other bit of your question and it was fantastic. Oh, the margin issue. So the margin issue there's a lot of debate over. Um, yeah. The Americans and the English have two separate guidelines for what we're happy with in terms of a margin. Um, in terms of breast cancer specifically, you'll have invasive tumors and then you'll have like pre-invasive changes. And so for the invasive tumors, the Americans will say that, you know what, as long as it's not where we've cut it, I'm happy. Whereas the British say, you know, we want a millimeter or two millimeters clean in order for us to be happy. And then with the pre-invasive stuff, they want usually around one millimeters to two millimeters. So there's still debate between countries. There's debate uh, between specialist associations and there's debate between the subtypes and the types of cancer in terms of what we are happy with and what we are not happy with. The good thing I think about fluorescence imaging is that if we can see up to those three millimeters or four millimeters below, then that would be more than clear enough for us to make sure that the cancer is out, if that makes sense. So if I've got a lump that's out and the lump is kind of glowing in my, the ex vivo is, and I take the lump and I take pictures of just the lump, well, then I might be getting signal through that healthy layer. And then if I look back in the cavity, and there's no signal, then I probably, I would assume, got it all because there's nothing left to glow through that, if that makes sense. So actually, in terms of breast cancer, the system works really well because of that depth limitation. But there is no consensus yet. And some of the girls that are on the call are working on uh, meta-analyzing all that data to try and see what system works better. Yeah. <laughs> to try and put it from a patient's point of view, if it's a choice between removing a, a bit too much and yet, and but being very safe that now the cancer has really been removed, all of it, or being very sparing with how much you take, and then there's a, a more of a risk that there's still some cancer behind. I imagine most patients would say, take more to be sure it's gone. Yes, however, that being said, breast cancer is, it's no longer a fatal diagnosis, like 85, 90% of women get through it absolutely fine and come out the other end. And so now the issue is in survivorship, where they now look in the mirror and they say, dear God, what have you done to me? Why is my breast gone? Why is it deformed? Why is it so much smaller than the other side? How could you like let this happen when you knew I was going to make it? And so that's where the whole idea of breast conserving surgery came about of try and get rid of just the lump and try and leave it as beautiful as you can so that they can walk away from this saying, this is something I survived, I'm over it. And so it is a difficult decision. We don't offer it to every patient. It's only patients that have a small enough tumor that has only one focus as opposed to like two different spots that are growing at the same time. And not everyone's eligible for it, but the benefits are they can walk away with a smaller surgery, with less scarring, with less psychological damage, if you will, and just as good a cancer outcome. And so for a lot of women, that makes a lot of difference. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that 20% risk is a hard pill to swallow, especially when you are that one that it happens to, because then it's 100% for you. But yeah. it is something yeah. that we counsel the patients with, and we do give them options. We don't say this is the only thing we're offering you. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a choice for them to make. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Of course. Um, yeah, I would, I would, I guess, go ahead, Penny. Hello. Um, I had a question. Um, your, the previous question was answered and um, part part of the answer about margins was talking about the margins on pre-invasive cancer, breast cancer. I'm, I'm guessing from how the um, imaging works that because it's contained in the ducts and doesn't go outside and interact with the blood vessels outside the ducts that you it won't show up um, on your technique, 
pre-invasive? So, so yeah, so we have been actually struggling with the pre-invasive cancer. You're absolutely right. The pictures that we showed you today were from invasive cases and the pre-invasive ones, because they're not um, as, they don't invade, they're not as sizable, they are giving us difficulties in terms of that signal. That being said, we are still running the analysis because I suspect that patterns in how the blood vessels come to supply, because that's already slightly abnormal tissue, that might already give us a distinct enough signal. But that's something that we're going to start running, I think, in the next few weeks in terms of the like um, pattern recognition test analysis. But you're right, it, that is actually the kicker is the precancer is the one that is giving most women the trouble of coming back rather than the actual invasive lump. And I, and I, I have a follow-up question if I can be greedy. <laughs> How about it? Um, there is um, presumably then, you mentioned the, um, this being used for other surgeries currently. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're, it's best working for near to the surface type surgeries with um, blood vessels that are um, sort of providing blood to cancerous cells. Is that correct? That can be applied to those sorts of surgeries at the moment. Uh, so in terms of actual clinical use, um, so the cancer stuff that we're doing is still theoretical, it's still research, we've not yet proven it. But in terms of actual use, you can map certain structures. So um, I don't know how much you guys know about colorectal surgery, but essentially when you're doing large bowel surgery to remove a cancer, there is certain, there's this pipe that connects your kidneys to your bladder called the ureter, and it's injured fairly regularly, unfortunately. Um, and you can actually use this to map that, um, to map that thing that's commonly injured and prevent damage to it because one of the drugs that you can give, you, you pee it out is the way that you get rid of it. And so part of that pathway is actually through that tube that connects the two. So there's different ways that you can use these things. Like the drug that we used here, you actually um, you poo it out. So it comes out from your liver into your bile and then out that way. And so if you're doing a gallbladder surgery and you have to find that pathway that connects everything, well, then you can see it even clearer there. Um, and that's also something that's sometimes a complication. So there's lots of ways that you can use this at this point in time. And cancer is something that we're still working on because we're very hopeful. The, the need is obviously there um, and it's just a matter of time until we crack it. Um, and it, it couldn't be, or may it be used for very targeted radiation, um, radiotherapy or are other imaging um, techniques better? For, for being very, very targeted on radiotherapy? Um, so radiotherapy is something separate. I don't know if, uh, Maria, would you mind showing that electromagnetic spe spectrum picture again? Um, so yeah, so radiotherapy sits in the X-ray and gamma ray area. Um, so that is a therapy where they use radiation, which is normally harmful to the body but they target it to be harmful to the cancer cells. And sometimes you do get a little bit of body reaction to it. So you get a bit of redness, tingling, some pain, discomfort, swelling, um, because it's not a kind thing to your body. Whereas what we're working with is in the UV infrared area, sorry, skip UV. Uh, it's in the visible and infrared area, which is very safe imaging. Um, ours is not a treatment. Ours is a supplement to surgery. So it's a little add on to make the surgery easier and better, um, whereas radiotherapy on its own is actually a treatment. Um, that being said, one of the drugs, which is the one that we will be using in the next group, the ALA, um, you can use that in something that's called photodynamic therapy, which means that when we send the light in, um, the light that comes out also gives out some heat. And that heat can cook the cancer on the inside, if that makes sense. But that, um, we would still be using it to guide the surgery rather than to cook, if that makes sense, because in a large enough volume, you will never cook everything through. Cooking is painful um, and just 
just well, uncomfortable for the patient. And so it's the way we will be using it is not to cook the cancer, but actually just to light it up and remove it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I meant in terms of using it as a, a precursor to the radiotherapy to pinpoint it more exactly, or are the current imaging techniques that they use before they uh, they send the radio they to identify the area for radiotherapy for the radiation treatment. So as a guidance tool, is it um, could it compete with? what they use currently to pinpoint the area to apply the radiation to in cancer treatments, for instance. Um, so, okay. I'm sorry, I misunderstood that. Um, th this, because it works in a different wavelength, they wouldn't be able to supplement. But that okay. being said, the current modalities that they use in terms of like they take x-rays and ultrasounds and they help, like they even give you a tattoo to help plan where the rays are gonna go each time. That is more than effective. Yeah, could I make a comment on that? Because radiotherapy, by its nature, if it's using x-rays and gamma rays, is going to, to spread over a reasonable volume. And you can't limit it to a very small volume. Uh, with proton radiotherapy, that's better. It's still not ideal. It's nowhere near as good as what you can do with surgery. Um, so the treatment itself is not confined to such a tiny pinpoint area. It um, cannot distinguish or it cannot be restricted to uh, distinguish between a, a margin and the main cancer because um, that requires millimeter accuracy and it's not as accurate enough to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Just like, you're right, just like uh, in surgery, there are um, uh, risk benefit considerations in therapy. And this is why there are, there is a lot of sh software they can, the, 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 the physicists are using in advance in order to calculate exactly um, what radiation um, each organ at risk is receiving. So if you have a tumor next to a risk, uh, an organ at risk which is healthy, you need to do the treatment planning, calculate the dose that is, uh, is given to each one of the organs, and then you decide on the optimal treatment solution, which may not, of course, be ideal because yes, apart from the tumor, you damage the, the surrounding organs. That being said, I fully agree with you, Gareth. Surgery is obviously the key to everything. Uh, and I say that with all the biases I have. <laughs> if in doubt, cut it out is the motto. Um, so the better we cut, the better we do. But the part and parcel of lumpectomies is getting the radiotherapy and unfortunately um, the side effects with it because nothing is perfect. Wonderful. We have time for one more question, if anyone else has a question for Maria or Marta or Nicholas. Yep, Harry? I'd just be interested to know the, you know, how the next stage of your research is being planned. Yeah, uh, so uh, basically uh, there are a lot of things to consider um, in such a project. It's not only the, the devices, it's uh, the fluorophores, it's the way you process the images. So there are a lot of different uh, ways we can, uh, we can try and solve, let's say, the problem. Uh, so now in, in, in the current clinical trial, which is the second one we, we've just presented, we will, we will be looking into a different contrast agent with the same device. So we are trying to use the same device, another contrast agent, and see if we can detect better the tumor than in the first case. So that's uh, one way we, we can try and improve um, um, the method. Also, um, apart from using another contrast agent, we are looking into different ways of uh, image processing the images. So let's say we still have the signal from ICG, 
what other ways are there to process this uh, information in order to understand where the tumor is? So image processing is a second way of trying and improving the technique. These all things are things we are currently work <coughs> are working on in, the, in this second clinical trial. But we also want to change different um, imaging systems, which do not use only fluorescence imaging, but other information based on how the light interacts with tissue. So we will take the fluorescence information based on all the knowledge we have so far, plus the extra information from the new image, from the new imaging device, and see how we can improve the technique. There are a lot of, of ways to look into how you can improve the, the, the accuracy in detecting the tumor. It's quite... Uh a long extended project really isn't it yes <laughs> a lifetime i would say very much so very much so wonderful well maria marta and nicholas thank you so much for joining us this evening and for doing what you promised to come and share the results of your um research i know that uh, some of us have have been with you maria since you since you started your phd three years ago so Thank you everyone who uh, has joined us this evening. Thank you again to our speakers. And um, I hope to see you again at the next Science Cafe. Thanks. Yeah, Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you.